Thank you, choir, for that wonderful start to our service. Welcome to you all to, on, to our service today. Um, if you don't know me, I am Deborah Scott Bromley and I'm leading the service and my colleague Sarah Haywood will be preaching. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please stand for our first hymn, which is We Have a Gospel to Proclaim, and it's number 798 if you are using hymn books. say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so now we bring to God those things which we want him to heal and forgive. Jesus Christ, 
risen master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive you your sins, open your eyes to God's truth, strengthen you to do God's will, and give you the joy of his kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. Please sit down for our reading from Scripture. The reading is taken from Acts chapter 3, verses 12 to 19. This comes after Peter has healed a crippled beggar, and the onlookers are so uh, amazed and in awe that they have rushed after Peter and John and the beggar who was walking with them. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong, it is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him 
as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that this, his Messiah, would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The gradual hymn is Crown Him with Many Crowns, number 150. Alleluia, alleluia. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Alleluia. alleluia. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. 
the disciples are in a locked room after the resurrection, fearful. And they've just heard the two disciples who were on the road to Emmaus telling us about their experience of the risen Christ. And we take up the story from there. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It's I myself. <coughs> Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. What a pleasure it is to get to preach on this passage from Luke's Gospel. There are so many parts of scripture which furrow the brow or can cause outright wincing as we chew our pencils wondering how to interpret the text. But this is not one of those passages. There is an exquisite simplicity to it. Here the disciples are terrified, meeting behind closed doors, locked away, hiding from the religious authorities. They're mourning the loss of their friend and teacher, the one who they truly believed would be the long-awaited Messiah who would save the people. All seems lost and hopeless, and then suddenly Jesus appears among them. And the first thing he says is, peace be with you. On Wednesday, I was preaching on the parallel account to this one in John's Gospel. And I mentioned there that in Hebrew, this phrase, shalom aleichem, it's still used to mean hello. So there is an element of dry humour here. The equivalent today would be a deceased person appearing out of thin air at the dinner table and saying hi. This is the pivot point. This is a moment the disciples had not imagined in their wildest dreams. After the greatest darkness, the longest night, this is the moment for the disciples, for all of us, when the sun rises. Pun intended. 
Verse 41 says they did not believe it because of joy and amazement. Isn't that a funny thing to say? But how truthful and how human. Things can get so bleak at times that we adjust our whole world view to being braced for yet more bad news. Certainly for the disciples after the relentless misery of the preceding days, it was hardly surprising that something so good and a cause for jubilation that this just would not compute. The thing that strikes me about this passage is the realness of Jesus. How practical and down to earth he is. You can picture him smiling, saying, look at me, touch me, I'm really here. Then when that doesn't fully work, Jesus does some performance eating. I don't know exactly how fish eating is a litmus test proving that you're not a ghost, but perhaps in those days it was. Verse 45 says, then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. And suddenly they get it. Everything falls into place. Biblical scholar Alfred Edersheim was a Jewish convert to Christianity living in the 1800s. He noted that there were 456 Old Testament verses referring to the Messiah or his times, and points out that Jesus fulfilled at least 300 prophecies in his earthly ministry. Disciples must have been deafened by the sound of 300 pennies dropping. Luke's Gospel is one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life. And Luke's purpose for writing it in his own words is to set down an orderly account about the things that have been fulfilled among us. Luke writes the story of Jesus in such a way that makes it clear it's not just dry history, but the fulfilment of the epic covenant story of God's relationship with Israel. Even wider than that, it's the story of God's relationship with the whole of humanity. It's perhaps best summed up by Jesus saying the words of Isaiah 61 in chapter 4, a kind of manifesto. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Jesus' realness, his understanding of humans is everywhere we look in Luke's account. The middle section of this gospel is a physical journey as Jesus heads for Jerusalem with his disciples. In the media we hear a lot about celebrities going on a journey with a particular issue in their life. That might be their latest album or a colonic cleansing regime, but this, this was a literal journey. The disciples walking alongside Jesus on dusty roads probably with chafing sandals as he traveled along, teaching and healing as he went. And the message he was preaching was just as real. The Pharisees and religious leaders' message centered on complying with every last jot and tittle of the Mosaic laws, sacrifices and observances that showed you were pure and holy and respectable. And this tradition carried with it a yearning for the long-promised Messiah, who they hoped would lead an army to overthrow Roman rule and bring the nation of Israel to power and prosperity. Jesus' message, on the other hand, turns all of this upside down. 
and brings matters much, much closer to home. Preaching good news to the poor meant a lot more than those who didn't have enough money. The Greek word translated as poor is tochis. Its meaning covers not just those in financial poverty, but people of low social status, people with disabilities, people who are outcasts, people who are outsiders. Jesus has fully practiced what he preached, making friends with tax collectors, prostitutes, people considered unclean due to having skin diseases, beggars, blind and deaf people. He is pointing to a life of radical generosity, where leading is done by serving, where religious hypocrisy is rejected, where we are peacemakers, committed to forgiveness. He showed us how a dog-eat-dog, punitive way of living can be reversed by God's love. Each one of you is here in the Abbey today because, in however great or small a way, Christ's vibrant, exciting message has struck a chord with you too. Either that or you've pitched up for the Trio Paradise concert and I'm sorry to tell you you're nearly a week late. <laughs> this message of love and welcome and being real is as fresh today as when Christ taught it to his followers. We're living in a digital age where the pace of life seems to get faster and faster where so many human interactions now seem to have been moved onto a screen. 85% of us in the UK own a smartphone, a tiny, powerful computer that gives us instant 24-hour access to all the terrible, frightening things happening in the world. Psychologists are warning of how febrile and unhealthy our minds become when faced with this information overload. It's very telling that the Silicon Valley bosses who create these devices refuse to allow their own children to have them. Against this backdrop, Jesus' clarity about what's important is like a cool glass of water on a hot day. He understands human frailty the anxiety and dread that can stop us sleeping and trap us in fear. He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Although faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, our God has always had deep compassion on our need to understand things through our five senses. We're not able to watch Jesus eat fish or poke him in the chest. But this week will bring each one of us moments of encounter with God as we go about our days. I want to encourage you to look for these moments and to notice them. And wherever you are in your faith, to engage with all that is most real. Just before I close, I don't normally do this. When I was talking with Harry yesterday about what to include in this sermon, and I was talking about the holes in Jesus' hands and what's real and our five senses, he said, tell them about the holes in my lawn all those years ago. When we were first together, Harry, where he was living, uh, noticed holes in his lawn. Didn't know what was making them. Couldn't work it out. I can, I can see a couple of you know what this is. And he looked at those holes and he started researching and finding out what they were. It turns out the holes were made by tawny mining bees. 
lots of blank faces, tawny mining bees are the most adorable, furry, golden syrup coloured bees. And they fly into the lawn and they live in the lawn. I don't know why, but God wanted me to share this with you. And I nearly did. And it <laughs> it's something that you know, it's not something I normally do. But there is something about holes, your senses, about noticing with your senses that can lead you to beautiful discoveries, that lead to life and joy and the sparkle that meets us in our taste. We are an Easter people. We too can join the disciples in their joy and amazement that Christ is risen. It is my prayer for you that you will be encouraged this week by God's eternal message of hope for a hurting world made manifest in the person of Christ. That you will be blessed with peace and that this peace will radiate from you into the lives of those you meet. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Please stand as we sing the words of the Queen.
seated for the anthem, which is a setting of Psalm 150 by our own director of music, John Hughes. <laughs> of intercession. Thank you. Let's pray and in a moment's silence remember God's presence here with us. Let us pray for God's church, our archbishops, Justin and Stephen, our bishop, Viv, for our vicar, Oliver, for our curate, Sarah, for our Maymoor chaplain, Deborah, and all members of the ministry team not forgetting our choir and John Hughes and all those who are involved in making this abbey such a joyful place of worship. We give you thanks, Lord, for, your, for the freedom to worship that we enjoy. And we pray for those throughout the world who from oppression or other pressures have that freedom restricted. Lord, in your mercy, let us pray for this world newly riven by the dangers posed in the Middle East between Iran and Israel. God bless King Charles and all members of the royal family. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the world that you have given us to live in. But what a mess humanity has made of it. 
Heavenly Father, grant to all the rulers of the world the understanding that war and violence solve nothing, but that peace and love lead to a fuller understanding of you and your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we remember before you all those who are sick, who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. In a moment's silence, remember in our hearts individuals known to us. Lord, we thank you for all those who have worked hard to improve the health of people, doctors, nurses, all the workers in the health service and in other care professions. Grant them strength to serve you and to serve the people they seek to heal. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those who have died recently or who we remember in our hearts as having died at this time of the year. Lord, be with those who mourn and grieve. Let them know that their loved ones are safe in your hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, Heavenly Father, we thank you for our lives, for our friends, our families, and all those for whom we care. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you like to stand for the peace? The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Also. Let's greet each other with a sign of peace. Peace be with you. Please forgive me, sir. Please forgive me, Yeah, I'll leave it. Yes, here we go. I'm first of all going to hand over to John, who has some 
very inspiring news for us. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, that's good. Um, I don't know about you, when I came to church this morning, I was driving along and loads of cyclists were going past me on their <laughs> travels. But imagine if you had to cycle from the Orkneys all the way down to the bottom of the UK. Imagine that. Um, we'll hear about Margaret. But here's the man who's going to do it, Alan in the choir. He's going to start on Friday. So I'll just ask him one or two things about it. So, where exactly are you starting? I'm starting in Orkney, so in Kirkwall in Orkney. Um, I'm trying to get 2,000, 2000 kilometres in, which is roughly 1,250 miles. And Gasp! <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of cycling down through Scotland, through the Great Glen, if you know that, between Inverness and Fort William, down the west side of Scotland, through Arrow, and down to the most southwestern point of Scotland, um, which is the Mother Galloway. My father's family were from that part of Scotland, and they had to take it in. Um, and then, yes, going over the Pennines, down the east coast, down the east side of uh, the Pennines, through York, and eventually arriving through Charlton, where I live, and Malmesbury. Um, hopefully two weeks Thursday, I think, um, if all goes to plan. And then finally, the sort of stretch down to Land's End. Um, now. I know that this is, you're doing this for a special charity, isn't that right? Yes, um, I brought this with me. So this is a jersey that my stepdaughters bought me. Um, it's for the brain tumour charity. And the reason I'm doing it for this charity is because my son's godfather died of a brain tumour. He was a very keen cyclist and he used to cycle 35 miles to where we lived in Devon, just for a cup of tea and a cake, and then cycle home. And what inspired me to do this journey, longer than, it's actually longer than normal Lansdowne, John O'Groats type of journey, is that one day he cycled over to our house and had his cup of tea and cake, and then he went to cycle home. In the next village, he met his cycle club, and he ended up doing this huge diversion uh, about 100 miles further than he wanted to. And it sort of just inspired me to, yeah, do this in memory of Brian. Um, and also um, a girl that I taught when I was a primary school teacher. She became one of my stepdaughter's best friends, and she died at the age of 30 um, with a brain tumour. So yes, it's quite close to my heart. Um, I'm sure I know lots of us would love to contribute to this. I know he's aiming at £2,000 and he's getting very close. But uh, one thing, either you could see him after the service, or I will put up the website on the notices next week so you can see what he's doing. But I think he needs a real big applause for what an amazing thing to do. And Alan, may God bless you in your journey, keep you safe, keep you well, and keep you going. God bless you. And just to let you know, um, the electoral roll, if you would like to be on the electoral roll for Malmesbury Abbey, there are application forms at the back in a blue folder on one of the tables. And um, also you would mind out to check if you are already on it. I think if you have any queries, you could speak to Marion, is that okay? Marion, who will be at the back um, or having coffee. But please have a look at that. And I think other than that, um, on, the on the 17th, which is this week, but I can't remember which day, there is a time of prayer and fellowship for bereaved parents uh, that will be held um, here, I think, in the St Aldham's Chapel at 1 till 3pm on that day. So you are very welcome to that if that affects you in any way. Other than that, I would ask you to read, mark, learn and inwardly digest your newsletter. There will be healing ministry after the communion. If you would like to be prayed with, either for yourself or for others, please, after communion, make your way into the chapel. If you do uh, wish to receive communion, 
there is, and all are welcome to the Lord's table. There is gluten-free bread and non-alcoholic wine available. Please just indicate. And if you would prefer to have a blessing, just keep your hands <coughs> folded. Thank you. And now our offertory hymn, if I could find it, is Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, number 152. Thank you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. In your loving care you spread before us the table of life and give us the cup of salvation to drink. Keep us always in the fold of our Saviour and our Shepherd, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Blessed be God forever. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and meet thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Almighty and Eternal Father. And in these days of Easter, to celebrate with joyful hearts the memory of your wonderful works. For by the mystery of his passion, Jesus Christ, your risen Son, has conquered the powers of death and hell, and restored in men and women the image of your glory. He has placed them once more in paradise, and opened to them the gate of life eternal. 
And so, in the joy of this Passover, earth and heaven resound with gladness, while angels and archangels and the powers of all creation sing forever the hymn of your glory. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again he praised you, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Lord of all life, help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours. O loving Father, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please sit down. <coughs> sit down. Rejoicing in God's new creation, as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Alleluia. 
Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation, and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that we may live in us and he in him, and that we, the company of Christ, may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen.
let us pray. Faithful God, in baptism you have adopted us as your children, make us members of the body of Christ, and chosen us as inheritors of your kingdom. We thank you that in this communion you renew your promises within us, empower us by your spirit to witness and to serve, and present disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And our final hymn is number 751, Thine Be the Glory. whose love Christ was raised from the dead, open to you who believe the gates of everlasting life. Amen. Amen. God the Son, who in bursting from the grave has won a glorious victory, give you joy as you share the Easter faith. Amen. Amen. God the Holy Spirit, who filled the disciples with the life of the risen Lord, empower you and fill you with Christ's peace. Amen. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you this Eastertide and forevermore. Go in peace, the peace of Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.